When you think about the performance of your software, there's nothing more low-level and fundamental than how your code executes on the CPU itself. Many of us study and try to understand how to maximize performance at this low level, but few are in a position to define what actually happens there. That's why I'm thrilled to share the work that Intel, the largest PC chip manufacturer, is doing specifically to make Python faster and to make their chips execute Python code even better. This week, you'll meet David Stewart, engineering manager in the Intel Data Center Software Technology Group at Intel. We'll discuss a wide variety of work Intel is doing in open source and Python. This is Talk Python to Me, episode 57, recorded May 2nd, 2016. I'm a developer in many senses of the word Cause I make these applications But I also use these verbs to make this music I construct it line by line Just like when I'm coding another software design In both cases, it's about design patterns Anyone can get the job done, it's the execution that matters I have many interests Sometimes Welcome to Talk Python to Me, a weekly podcast on Python The language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities this is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. This episode has been brought to you by SnapCI and now Metis. Thank them for supporting the show on Twitter via snap underscore CI and this is Metis. That's right, Metis and their data science education team have joined the show to keep the episodes coming. Be sure to find them on Twitter and tell them thank you. David, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Michael. It's great to talk with you. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you on the show today, and I'm, I'm looking forward to looking inside what you guys are doing at Intel with Python. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I, it's really ex been exciting to me. I think people have been really uh, re uh, responding uh, when they hear that Intel is doubling down on Python um, just because of its uh, power and po you know, popularity. So I think it's, uh, um, it, it's exciting to be a part of that for sure. Yeah, it's, it's really exciting to be part of Python in general. I mean, it, it's really surprising in, in a pleasant way to me to continue to see this language and ecosystem that's 25 years old gaining momentum and gaining speed. You kind of feel like it would have done whatever it did in the first five or 10 years, but that's not the case. It's, it's great. So nice to see and tell. Your listeners probably, you're probably already aware of the fact that the, the uh, um, top uh, the majority of the top CS schools in the U.S. are are teaching Python as the first introductory language, right? That that's that that's often a surprise when I talk. I was just talking to a professor of computer science last week, and he was like, "Really? They just didn't know about that." So, yeah, it's really taken hold. Yeah, I think that's great. And you know, to be honest, it makes me a little bit jealous. I my very first uh, CS, not my first programming class, but my first CS class that was for programmers was in scheme and lisp and i would have definitely oh preferred, my gosh. yeah i would have definitely preferred to get uh python in there but you know you get what you get yeah no <laughs> i know what you're talking about my well you know if you were talking about pity here my first was with fortran and in fact i had to teach fortran programming to you know to engineering students and the like as a, a part of a graduate teaching assistantship back in the day so uh <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, I didn't necessarily do a lot of programming in Fortran myself, but it was one of those things where you sort of had to cut your teeth on something. And uh, there's still people using Fortran these days, but it's uh, probably more than Lisp, but it's yeah. hard to say. Yeah, it's got to be waning. I, I hope so. Yeah, I think we share some uh, common history. Like, I started out in, yeah, I started out in, um, in an engineering field, not in computer science. And when I got there, they said, you have to have a programming class. I said, great, can I take C++? No, you have to take Fortran first. This is the most important language you will ever learn in your life. And then yeah. you can go take those other less meaningful ones. Yeah. So I, was like, I took yeah. that, and then I, I went to CS, and I said, can I please take C++? I said, no, you have to take Ski. I'm like, what? Why can't I do a real program? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to get some hate mail for saying that, but that's okay. I'm sure you will. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I really, I, I do like C++, but I, I wish I had Python in the beginning. That would have inspired me more, even though I was already inspired to, to do programming. Yeah, I, and I think the, the, it's been particularly interesting. As, uh, there's so many open source projects that are you know, kind of advanced by some corporate entity or something like that. Python is a phenomenal uh, project because 
sort of like the Linux kernel itself, right? It's, it, there are plenty of companies involved with Linux, but it's, it's really, you know, uh, with Linus Torvalds being the, you know, the, the, um, you know, the lead that makes a final decision on things. And Python, that's one of the strengths, I think, is, is the, the kind of, uh, approach that Guido uses. Guido Van Rossum, who's the benevolent dictator for life for Python. I think he's really created, um, uh, you know, just kind of a, an ethos and a, and a culture around this project that I think is, is super unique. And in fact, it, I, it's a great, uh, I hold that as a great example for uh, people who aspire to, uh, you know, establish new open source projects. I mean, hey, this is, this is one of the ways that you, you talk about, yeah, 25 years of, of, uh, of you know, experience. And, and Guido's, you know, I think a phenomenal leader for that, that movement. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's doing a great job. And I think there's a lot of positive examples of the Python community being a, a very positive place for open source. And that's great. So before we get into the, the story about what you guys are doing with Python, maybe you could just sort of tell me how you got into programming in Python. You said you took uh, Fortran in college. So how did you get to there? Yeah, I mean, you know, I when I got my uh, master's in, in, in bachelor's and master's in computer science, I mean, C was was really uh, the most interesting language to me at the time because I was doing a lot in operating systems, and so um, I've been probably over the years of my career probably more interested in you know operating systems in general instead of languages per se. And since C is a, a great language, you know, initially when I worked with it with Unix and then uh, you know Linux, obviously, uh, I think that's one of the things that, that it was. It's just when I think in terms of programming, it's still hard for me not to relate back to C. But the you know the the Python work came as a result of a couple of things I got involved with back in 2010. What happened was I was asked to start up a new project here at Intel to work on embedded uh, uh, embedded Linux, and it was um, kind of an amazing thing. The core of this project had this uh, uh, something called BitBake. And if you're not familiar with it, what BitBake does is it's a desktop application that will build a complete Linux distribution. Now, this is actually quite interesting because what it does is it builds the compiler first, right? And it, it has to bootstrap several different passes of compiler building to get a, a functional compiler, right? And then you, it goes in, um, a Linux distribution could be make up, made up of like literally a thousand different projects all over the internet, internet. Individual projects with their own source control systems, their own repositories. And this system will actually download the sources from all these different projects, uh, goes and patches the source. Of course, if you have an open source system, you want to be able to, you know, do, do patching of those things, right? Then it will configure them, build them, build a, a, a package repository, build a running in Linux image, and then a, an SDK. And the amazing thing is that it does all of this in an hour, like one hour on a desktop computer. And you're going, wait, hold on. Ha what magic is this thing doing? And I started talking to the architect of this thing, and it's a massive Python pro program. So BitBake is actually completely written in Python. I'm, I was like, you know, I, I got to confess, I was like, holy cow, this is a scripting language? And I heard about, you know, things like, uh, you know, you were able to serialize and deserialize objects, and it's like, hang on, this is, this is really powerful stuff. So um, I, I worked on that project for about five years. That was a project called the Yocto Project. So anybody who knows that, was, that was something I was involved with. And then, you know, uh, things were going, you know, pretty well. And I, I kind of get, you know, a, a little bit, um, you know, sedate, I guess, when things are going too well. So I always like to have a, a challenge. And, and at that point, um, Intel was really uh, interested in, as I said, doubling down on Python because it's primarily the core of a lot of uh, a lot of key things that Intel is is invested in in other areas. And so, um, and, and besides its, its overall popularity as a you know as a programming language, so um, that was when uh, I really you know got personally very invested in what was going on in Python. And so I you know started a group, and and we have engineers that are that are at the core of of working on that. So that was that was where I I think I got really uh, a lot of Python uh, religion, obviously, at that point was was uh, not only seeing it as a user incredibly powerful, but also be able to now, uh, I think, affect it positively as a, on a on a community basis. We're going to dig into some of the cool stuff you guys are doing on the community basis as, as well. But uh, you sort of started out with the the philosophy of it's in Intel's interest to sort of understand modern cloud computing and the languages that derive that and make that stuff go really well. That's correct. I mean, if you think about, you know, um, Intel, obviously we're trying to sell processors in the uh, data center space. I think we've had some success there. Um, one of the things that if you look at overall, how are 
how are people programming those data center processors? Well, there's obviously a lot of C++, C Sharp, and Java, um, no question. But um, as we kind of analyzed things we, things, we said, well, gee, there are 7 million PHP programmers out there. There's like 9 million JavaScript programmers, a considerable number on, you know, on data center computers. And then Python is, is huge in that respect, too. So if you look at the top languages that people are using uh, our processors to, to run, right, it, it sort of says, well, how do it, you know, I'm, I'm all about customer choice in that respect. I'd like to make sure whatever customers are using, they get the best, you know, possible experience with our processors. And so um, it just it just feels like um, whether, you know, it's OpenStack work or some of the things that people are using Python for in, like, high-performance computing and uh, or, or uh, big data and analytics, um, machine uh, learning. Uh, it, it, there's just a lot of applications of Python, and it just it just seems like um, for Intel as a company to to, to not be kind of uh, investing that and, and making it great on our on our processors. It's it's just it's it's not a good idea. So I, I love one of the things I love about this is that we're being agile in, in, with respect to our, how we invest in in the software that's running on the data center on our processors, and we're trying to. Again, if our customers are using this stuff, we want to make sure that we have the best sort of, um, you know, the best sort of experience for them. So hopefully they'll come along and, and buy our processors uh, uh, on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I, I hope so. It sounds sounds great. So can you give me some some idea of what, like, how what are you studying in Python? You're down. Are you looking at sort of the C Python implementation and how it's working and, and understanding how that's running on your chips? And, and things yeah. like this, or what's the story there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our our philosophy is, uh, you know, it's it's kind of what I call the core software strategy, which basically says this: it's like you can go off and you know work on speeding up some you know customer's application or or some other you know kind of system. You, you know that's that's a that's great, but then you know at the end of the day, you you know you've optimized that one piece of software. You haven't really you know, optimize anybody else's Python code, right? So, for example, um, let's take uh, let's take Swift. Uh, it's an open source uh, object storage subsystem that's part of uh, that's part of OpenStack, and it's implemented in Python. And if you look at that and you go, well, I could go work on the Swift source code, right? The Python Swift source code to make it faster. But then it'd be better if I could actually speed up Python instead that core software and so in theory if i speed up swift i'll also speed up anything else that's using that that accelerated python right so the way we achieve that core software strategy is we've developed some really um, amazing abilities i mean the engineers on the on the team have just done an, an amazing job to analyze exactly where the processor is spending its time as it's running, you know, major Python code, right? So we're actually able to go at a very deep level, and we had some really very interesting um, discoveries that we've made at the microarchitectural level. Um, and, you know, I can tell you more about that. It's, it, it's kind of it's interesting. But, I mean, um, clearly we see some things that are, are some challenges from a microarchitecture standpoint. So we go, well, if we're going to improve the performance, we need to do what we can to address those things with the current products and then give feedback to our chip architects to say, hey, man, you, you need to change the – the, the way that the chip is designed to run these languages better. So this is a, it, it's like a, a, not an either or for us, it's like a both and. Um, understanding the, the architecture at a deep level, we can go in and really speed up uh, Python, uh, and we can also go tell the chip architects to design better chips. So, um, uh, and along those lines, yeah, I, I, our philosophy is totally uh, upstreaming all of these things, and so, as much as possible, I sort of go, I mean, I, philosophically, I like to put the cookies on the low shelf so everyone can get at them. As much as possible, I want to make sure that we don't just do some amazing sort of things and that we upstream them, but then, you know, I want to make sure people know about them, right, so they can take advantage of them too. And I want to make it, I want to be a, a contributor to the community so that they can, you know, take advantage of the hard work that we're doing as well. Yeah, that's that's really excellent. So it manifests sort of in two ways. You can improve C Python. And we're just getting started talking about the, the possibilities there, right? And then how dramatic of a change can you make at the chip level? I mean, I, I think it's really cool that you're like thinking about, okay, well, here's our current architecture and the way things are working. But when you run Python code, this could be better. Would it? Would the chip actually detect what type of code it's running? Like, 
it, does it work at that level or they're just, you're like, these types of uh, operations could be better? Well, actually, our chip architects have a, a long practice of looking at how current software runs on current chips. And we actually have a, a, some great tools to be able to analyze that at an at a instruction level that, say, that says, okay, you're running, oh, I don't know whether it's a database or whether it's, you know, Python or something else, and be able to analyze, you know, okay, here's the, here's the series of instructions that get run. And then they can play a lot of interesting, you know, conceptual games uh, with that and say, well, what if we added this instruction, um, a new instruction to optimize this thing? Or what if we change the way the cache works to you know, run this stuff better or, you know, and, and, you know, we're actually by having us involved with them, um, we're actually able to come up with some really uh, interesting ideas and say, well, Hey, maybe we could um, have this kind of, you know, acceleration or this kind of idea about how to run um, th these languages better. Right. So um, our hope is that, uh, yeah, the, you know, and, and so the current chips are really designed uh, from just years of running code, uh, you know, of existing software against it. And so, you know, some of it's making up for bad software practices, bad programming practice. And it's like, oh, if people write code this way, maybe if we organize the chip this way, it would run, you know, sort of poor code faster or something like that. Not to say that anyone's code is crap. I'm not saying that. But there's a lot of crappy code that's out there, right? Yeah. I'm sure none of your listeners have bad code. I'm sure they don't, but... But if they listen to other podcasts, they, they may. No, I'm just teasing. They, they, I'm sure they're fixing other people's bad code, not their own. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, right. but, I mean, you know, that's a, that's a key, you know, observation in, in terms of the chip. Now, I couldn't necessarily go into a lot of ideas on the, on the podcast, but we're, we're working on a bunch of, of really intriguing ideas, uh, in my opinion, about uh, ways that we can really run this stuff uh, much, much better. Yeah. I think it's cool to know that you guys out there are, are actually thinking about, you know, specifically studying these different runtimes like Python and Node.js and PHP and so on and understanding sort of how they're, they're working and not working on your hardware and then adjusting for that. When would the first uh, sort of fruits of these labors show up? You said in 2010 you got started with uh, the, the, the Linux embedded stuff and then later you got into Python. So how far down the road does this stuff land? Yeah. And, and by the way, I, I, the one thing I was going to add to your, your observation about the work that we do, we've actually been doing this work with Java now for, I think, 15 years. And we have this nice little chart that we compare from generation to generation, how much the chip speeds it up, but all, how much our software, uh, you know, JVM's, you know, changes have accelerated in, in each of those generations. And so we're just playing back the same playbook, basically, that we've been using for years with Java. Um, what I would say in terms of the fruits of our labor, actually, when we began the group, we had our first uh, performance patches uh, available to the community, I think within about like three, four months or so, and we're on the order, order of a, like a 10% performance boost. On, and, you know, you think, well, 10%, that can't be great. But in fact, with here's my experience with data center level code, whether it's, you know, massive database uh, benchmarks for like TPCC or this, uh, you know, running Swift or, or some of these other big, big, big customer workloads on a data center. If you can boost something, you know, five to 10 percent, you are just like, you are like golden. That's like awesome. It's very unusual to find a real customer benchmark that gets, you know, some multiple of, you know, many X uh, speed. Of it. it just doesn't happen, right? And so realistically, if you can improve the throughput by a few percent, um, usually pretty, people are pretty happy about that. So we came up with our first patches. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was about three, four months after we started analyzing things and look at some low-hanging fruit of places where we could pull in some um, some stuff pretty quickly and get the experience with the community, you know, talking with Guido, talking with other community uh, developers to try and really, you know, hone our, 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 you know, our efforts there. And the first time we, we kind of took a look at PyPy, um, that's when we said, well, shoot, maybe we could get a much, much higher, you know, return with, with PyPy. Maybe we could get a whole lot more than just a few percent here and there. So that's, that became extraordinarily interesting. This episode is brought to you by SnapCI, the only hosted cloud-based continuous integration and delivery solution that offers multi-stage pipelines as a built-in feature. SnapCI is built to follow best practices like automated builds, 
testing before integration and provides high visibility into who's doing what. Just connect Snap to your GitHub repo and it automatically builds the first pipeline for you. It's simple enough for those who are new to continuous integration, yet powerful enough to run dozens of parallel pipelines. More reliable and frequent releases, that's Snap. For a free, no obligation, 30-day trial, just go to snap.ci slash talkpython. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's kind of what I was hinting at, like we're just getting started. So the majority of people who run Python code, they run it on CPython. That's the default thing you get if you go to python.org and you download it. But there are many other runtimes or implementations. The the most popular one around performance is probably one called PyPy, P-Y-P-Y. But we also have Python coming out of Dropbox and, and Guido's group there. We've got Cython, Jython, Iron Python. There's there's a lot of options. And so you turn to the uh, probably one of the more established high performance alternatives to CPython, PyPy, right? That's correct. And, you know, for us, it's like I, I didn't want to be married to anything until we really got a chance to see, you know, kind of what was going on in the landscape. I mean, we looked at all of these, frankly, and uh, they all have their pros and cons. I mean, things like Cython, et cetera, you know, basically creating C code. That's that's a that's a nice model for performance. The challenge is that kind of takes away some of the you know, development speed you get from an actual interpreted language, um, you know, and, and PyPy for it, and Pigeon and Piston um, have interesting qualities. I don't, um, it, you know, the thing that I like about PyPy is as follows. I mean, one for one thing, it's been around 10 years, right? So um, it's got, as far as I can tell, the broadest compatibility of any of these uh, efforts. Um, it's focused on both Python 2 and Python 3. I, I think that it... You know, it's really hasn't received um, a ton of, you know, broad sort of help from folks, you know, like these performance guys that I work with here at Intel. I mean, I, I, I think they've done an amazing job, uh, absolutely amazing, stunning. I'm, I'm incredibly impressed. We had a great sprint with them, uh, 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 you know, basically in, the, uh, in March of, of this year and um, a face-to-face uh, effort with their core developers. And it was just uh, really very, very effective. And then there was a, uh, another release of uh, PyPy that came out as a result of the sprint. You know, so I think we're just getting started working with it. Um, the results have been nothing short of stunning. I mean, this is what really impressed me because, as like I said, we're working with Swift, because it's a part of OpenStack. We're doing a lot of stuff with OpenStack at Intel. It, you know, Swift is the part of OpenStack that seems to spend a lot of its time in Python. It's in, as we analyzed it, 70% of the cycles, 70, 80% of the cycles when you're running Swift is actually in the Python interpreter itself. Um, so it's like, oh, there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, then we look at, at uh, we split that down further, and it's like really being, you know, like 30% of those cycles are just in the main interpreter loop of C Python. So we said, well, let's try PyPy, as you said, PyPy, and it's it's incredible. We got 111% throughput improvement. Now, pause for a second and say, okay, I was looking at a few percent here and there, and here I've gotten more than double the throughput of using PyPy, right? And it's like compared to C Python. Amazing. And then it's like an 87% response time improvement. And it's like, if something's like a software system, I mean, throughput's great because, right, you can scale up more and more users and you get, you know, great throughput. But the response time is what people really respond to, right? I mean, this is like, it means they're accessing files, whether you're like, for example, Wikipedia, all of the, you know, sort of images that people look at in Wikipedia are all managed by Swift. Right, so you can look at something like that, and that just brings up your Wikipedia pages faster. Um, I've talked to various customers who are using Swift for their, you know, object storage system, and yeah, this is a this is a huge deal when you get that kind of improvement. So it's like, well, with such amazing, you know, speed ups, why wouldn't we try to, you know, see if we can, you know, provide a little, uh, you know, love to the to the project to see if we can, you know, really do a, you know, continue to to make this uh, maybe even the default of how people use Python. Okay, yeah, that's really amazing. Do you know if you can run all of OpenStack on PyPy? Yeah, we're actually in the process of of um, getting that together. We have the let's see, uh, so far Swift, Keystone, 
Nova and Neutron uh, ported. And uh, I would, uh, uh, you know, I would say trying to get a, like a proof of concept where we have all the core services running in PyPy. Um, I'd like to, us to, to really be able to, to do that maybe before the next OpenStack Summit in the fall in uh, Barcelona. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to, to show that off. Uh, Keystone, uh, I said, is another interesting service that's written in Python. Keystone, if you're not familiar with it, is the, um, it's the user authentication part of OpenStack. So essentially, every OpenStack service has to go through Keystone to see if you're authorized to do the things you're saying you want to do, right? And so it's a really, you know, centralized part of the project. And we were able to speed it up by 37% using PyPy. So um, that's, again, pretty uh, pretty darn amazing. So I think uh, um, I'd like to see the entire, yeah, I'd like to see PyPy as the default. In fact, years ago, the OpenStack gate had a uh, requirement that everything had to work with PyPy. And a year or so ago, that got dropped. And I'd like to see, bring that back and if possible, try and drive, you know, something that would have the whole, um, you know, community basically making use of, of PyPy within OpenStack. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. And if you're running something like OpenStack, you're running on a lot of machines and efficiency is going to make a big difference in that type of system, right? Absolutely. And, you know, if you think about this, it's in some respect, it's not kind of radical. Every other interpreted language uh, whether it's Java, JavaScript, PHP, you name it, Lua, all, they have all gone the direction of a JIT in order to improve performance. And uh, and it, it, here, let me let me tell you how this this works, right? If you've got two, if, let's say you're adding two integers together, right, in Python, very simple operation. You know, if you're running um, native code. Uh, on our processors, right? There's one instruction that adds two integers together, right? In, in some cases, it can be even less than one instruction with uh, opcodes using some features that we have. With Python, um, C Python in particular, we did a measurement and showed that on average, it takes 76 instructions to add two integers together, right? So automatically, you can see a stunning difference in, you know, we got great processors. They run instructions very fast. But you're running one instruction versus 76 is definitely going to be fast. That is, uh, that's a very hard thing to compensate for. Yeah. So as a result, you know, the processor spends a lot of it because the code fr footprint is just huge on, on something like Python. And so, you know, you spend a lot of the processor spends a lot of its time. It says, we, we talk about it being uh, cycle stalled in the front end. And what that basically means is the first two um, stages. Uh, we, if you think about it, I'm sorry to, uh, if they, uh, let me just mention this briefly. I won't geek out on this too much, but it's like, if you think about the five stage pipeline for a processor, a modern processor, um, you get best performance if you can get all the stages of the pipeline running in parallel, right? The problem is our processors are spending like half of their time twiddling their thumbs waiting for new instructions to get fetched and decoded. So um, if we can, you know, make a huge difference to that, and, it, 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 and a lot of it, frankly, comes down to the simply the size of the instructions, the size of the code footprint that we're trying to process, right? And so a JIT um, directly addresses that because what a JIT is going to do is it's going to look at the hot um, interpreted, uh, you know, code and, and generate native code, right? So instead of that 76 instruction for an ad, if it's a, if it's a hot ad, it will basically run in one instruction because it'll be running native code instead. So this is, it's not a, this is not a huge secret. It's not magical. It's something that is a, a really, you know, well-worn technique to make this happen. And I'm telling you, every other language has, uh, has gone this direction. And as I've, you know, as Guido and I have talked about this as well, he's like, you know, he's, you know, supportive. He's like, he says, I don't have a dog in the fight. You know, he's basically, he's more of, I think, interested in the advances of the language as opposed to these performance things. Usually he's not thinking in terms of the performance side. But I'm, you know, in thinking about the performance side, I said, hey, could we really help the overall project by, you know, having a, um, you know, a, a great uh, interpreter for, uh, Python that really runs really super fast. By the way, they're able to achieve greater performance by several other things in terms of the garbage collection uh, um, that they're able to do. Uh, that in various ways, they have much lower memory footprint as well. And so um, this is something that several of these techniques they're able to use to get really stunning performance. Yeah, the the PyPy guys are doing a great job. And they're, they definitely do some interesting stuff. I, I talked to them on episode 21. One of the things that I thought was interesting is the way that they don't immediately jit everything, but they kind of wait until they find a hot spot and then they go and jit that. Right. 
Right. That's a that's a, again a well worn technique that, that has a lot ton of fruit in the the Java space as an example, right? They even call their JIT a uh, hotspot is what it's what it's called, right? So this is a this is a common technique and I think it, it works really well. Yeah. I, I th- yeah, I think the challenges that you run into is with languages like Python, they're so flexible and you can change the types so much that it, it's not as easy as jitting something like Java, right? Oh, yeah. And particularly when, you know, because it's one of the really attracting, attractive things about the language is how, you know, flexible it can be in terms of typing. You don't have to spend a lot of time, you know, coming up with the types and documenting all those things. And so, you know, coding that is Pythonic, it really is, uh, has that, you know, kind of power and flexibility. Unfortunately, that power and flexibility also comes with a cost and typically, you know, means that you have to spend a lot of code trying to figure out, now oh, what is the type of this thing and did it change since the last time I looked at it? And right. So, so that's a, a, a strong consideration when trying to run this stuff fast. Yeah. I think there's a lot of attention being given to speed and Python lately. I, I've noticed a, a big uptick in projects and people focused on trying to make Python faster, be that through PyPy or the Microsoft pigeon or I just spoke to the Euphora guys about distributed compiled Python. There's there's a whole bunch of really interesting things, and I they're not all mutually exclusive. I, I think they're going to come together, and some pretty amazing stuff is going to come out of it. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that one of the strengths of the Python community is the fact that you do have um, a lot of freedom for uh, innovation. And, you know, the up, uptake in, you know, the uptick in performance projects, I've noticed that as well. I think part of that's just because it has become so um, uh, well adopted that I think if they don't solve the performance thing, you know, I think people will sort of get frustrated and go into other things. You know, for example, in the high performance computing space, you have people who are scientists and, uh, you know, um, people studying data and things of that sort, as opposed to being programmers, right? And th- they love Python because they can, you know, a- a implement their code using Python. But then they go, well, this is performing slowly, so, you know, let me recode it in something else, right? And I think our vision would be that people don't have to, you know, change their language to get better performance. I'd love it to be a, a no compromises uh you know, experience with Python, right? And then we can bring to bear the best of our, you know, microarchitectural analysis tools, software optimization tools, and frankly, analysis tools as well. We've got a terrific uh, visual uh, profiler called VTune that lets you, you know, pinpoint the exact area in your Python code that is, uh, you know, causing your problems, um, performance problems. We also have, uh, um, you know, a set of Python libraries that are, uh, particularly if you're using NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, um, Scikit-Learn, a variety of those packages, um, we have a, an accelerated version of those as well in a Python product. So there's there's a lot of, you know, but our common vision, you know, goes end to end in that sort of thing, whether it's the upstream stuff that, that we're doing or the, the Python product, we just want to make sure that the experience people have with Python is, is, is no compromises relative to, to performance. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I want to talk about the, the NumPy, the data science stuff in a, in a moment. This portion of Talk Python to Me is brought to you by Metis, offering data science training in New York City, Chicago, San Francisco, and online. Led by a deep team of senior data scientists, Metis delivers immersive boot camps, corporate workshops, online training, and part-time professional development courses in data visualization, machine learning, big data, and other data science skills. Their full-time boot camp is the only accredited data science boot camp available and includes extensive career support. Metis maintains a busy event schedule, so be sure to check them out on Meetup and keep in touch via at thisismetis on Twitter and learn more about them on the web at thisismetis.com. So you said that you had worked with the PyPy guys and you actually got them together to do a sprint with some people on your team. Is that what the story was? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, it turns out that the, all of the core PyPy developers are in Europe, and uh, except for uh, Matrik, who's in South Africa. And I have a staff of, of developers working on Python that are in uh, in Europe. And so we brought everybody together. Turns out it's in, in uh, Bucharest, 
Romania. And so um, we got everybody together physically um, in the same room. Um, there were actually a couple of uh, folks from the academic world, a couple of universities that wanted to come in and, you know, work. Once I got wind of this happening, they, they said, man, we want to get involved in this too. So, uh, you know, it, it was a very effective sprint and uh, um, great to get that teamwork going. I feel like we now have a great understanding not only of, you know, PyPy, but also the uh, microarchitectural tools that we have to analyze performance and things of that sort. So we can now turn this thing, I think, into a really um, uh, powerful uh, kind of collaboration with the PyPy project. Oh, that's great. And I think that's it's really great that you were able to help get everyone together because that's one of the real big challenges of these open source projects that are somewhat large is just physically getting the people together. So there, there might be people on projects that have never met before, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I tell you, I've been working in specifically open source projects since like the mid 2000s. And, and it's true that the you know, open source would never have been, you know, wildly successful without the internet. But, but trust me, when you can get people physically face to face, you can get human to human contact in, in a physical, you know, same physical space, you, you get, you eliminate a lot of inefficiencies and barriers and, and you get a lot of progress very quickly. And so um, as far as I'm concerned, that's a, that's, that's a worthwhile sort of investment to get uh, people, the smart people together in a room and work on real problems and produce code as a result. Yeah. Even just getting to know people for a long weekend, that can last like a whole year's worth of goodwill from that, right? Absolutely. No question. Yeah. Great. Uh, so that's a huge commitment back to the PyPy group and all of that is open source, of course. Have you done anything where you've taken some of this work and research and, and gotten it back into C Python? Yeah, we're, we're trying to be um, not an it's not an either or for for me, at least. It's like there's still, you know, adoption of PyPy is not very currently not very high. Um, a lot more people are running code on C Python. So it's not a like an either or for me, it's more like a both and. Um, and the same thing goes for Python 2 versus Python 3. I mean, even though Python 3 is, is the place where Guido and the rest of the community, the, the, the development community would like everybody just to be doing things on Python 3, reality is core services in, in OpenStack, a lot of other code is still in Python 2. So that's our commitment to the community is as we do performance work, um, we're doing it for both Python 2 and Python 3. And and we're really trying to pull off a thing where we can do C Python and uh, PyPy as well. So um, you know we we have I think there's some uh, technical issues that we can it's like I said give a little bit of love to in terms of making it much easier to use PyPy in many of these circumstances. So there's some engineering work along those lines as well that we're trying to um, invest in also to to eliminate if there are any deployment issues or any issues with uh, um, you know with the garbage collector or something like that. We, we're really trying to you know, really eliminate those. And um, it, there is a class of uh, code that uh, ch is challenged partly because PyPy is so fast. You know, this is, this is the amazing thing to me is that we've, we've encountered a couple of places where, you know, people have coded a timeout in Python and, you know, the code wasn't exactly correct. And so when you switch to PyPy, which is multiple times faster, right, suddenly these timeouts fail because, you know, the code, you know, isn't exactly correct. Now, it's not necessarily something I can fix um, in PyPy. I mean, I'd love to f figure that out somehow, but I'm not sure that's, that's going to be possible. But, that, that, you know, we've seen this now in a couple of very interesting uh, instances where people, you know, write their code and, you know, it's, it, uh, but, you know suddenly when you speed it up a lot, it, 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 it breaks because it's made some assumptions about how slow it's, it, it should be running. It, it got to the weight too quickly, huh? It's an it's a odd problem to have. But, you know, that is, frankly, when you're going to do a drastic uh, improvement in performance, you may find an issue like that that pops up. So in any case, that's something we've seen a little bit of, but um, hopefully people can, uh, can fix their code because I think that's, that's probably a good thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's obviously the fix. Like, hey, let's just not wait so long. <laughs> anyway, so it sounds to me like you have this multi-pronged approach. You're trying to make the processors faster by understanding how they run Python code, trying to make CPython faster, trying to make PyPy faster. Another one of the prongs on making things faster or addressing this Python performance story is around something you call the Intel distribution for Python. And you kind of hinted at that before, right? What's the story there? Yeah, and, and this is, uh, again, we have sort of um, two-pronged strategy here. One, one strategy says, let's do 
you know, everything upstream and open source. And the other is, is there some way we can kind of pinpoint some of the key pinch points that people have, um, and that it may be that we have some code, you know, internally that will accelerate those things. So, you know, uh, in particular, when you're running, um, you know, math functions, this is something that in the evolution of people's Python code, right, they write, they write, write these things initially in Python, and then it's like, wow, this is kind of a, this is kind of a performance uh, pinch point. Is there something we can kind of do to improve it? So a lot of times people recode these things in C, and it's like, okay, and, and NumPy is a great example of that, right? So what we've actually been able to do is say, gee, we have this uh, library here. It's called MKL. It's called our math kernel libraries, right, where, where some incredibly smart people have gone at, at the deepest possible level to have math functions and execute them just as, as fast as, as, as possible, right? So they're highly tuned, very... Uh, you know, very, very bespoke sort of code, right? So, um, you know, what they've done is is done an amazing job uh, hooking up MKL with uh, NumPy, SciPy, and these, these other popular libraries. Um, and so that's code that they actually they call the Intel Python distribution or Intel distribution. I could get the I, I might have the name wrong, but it's a, it's actually in beta now as we're talking. And so um, that should be uh, something uh, some get in on the beta program, or if they're listening to this at a, a later time, they may in fact uh, be already uh, released. So that's that's another I think great alternative, particularly if you're using those scientific libraries to to basically make use of that and and see you know if that's going to improve things. In some cases, I think they they found some code that's you know, again, it, it can multi-thread some of these operations, whereas with, uh, you know, regular Python, it's, it's, it's more or less single-threaded. And so with multi-threading, depending on how many cores you can throw at it, they've seen up to 100x on some math functions that they've uh, been able to speed up. So that's, uh, that's pretty stunning. There's also some data analytics um, functions that are part of this. And so uh, I think that's a, that's a really intriguing option as well. Yeah, that does, does sound intriguing. And it sounds to me like what you're actually targeting there is you're targeting the the C extensions or the C foundations of some of these heavily C sped up libraries. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. It's a strategy that again is like we don't want to have to have have people make a, a choice between well, do I want to stick with Python or do I want good performance, right? We want to be able to make it so that it's it's a no compromise situation. So frankly, this is another alternative that lets us you know target. You know, some users that, that really want super high performance in this mathematical area and high performance computing is another area that we've uh, invested in pretty heavily here. So this is a way to, you know, get directly into that space and help them out. Yeah. And I guess you guys probably understand better than anybody how to exactly line up the math to work on your processors, right? Yeah, we really uh, have have some amazing uh, uh, tools and uh, analytics to be to. Yeah, when you're when you sit next to the guys designing the chips. It's usually uh, you know much easier to be able to, to to squeeze out that last little bit of performance in any possible case. Yeah, yeah, sounds great. I'll be sure to link to that in the show notes. So one of the things that uh, we talked about last week is you were actually at the OpenStack conference, right? Maybe you can give That's us a correct OpenStack yeah. summit. Yeah, awesome. Give us a rundown on what happened there. Yeah, um, this is really exciting to me because the OpenStack summit is you know every six months. Um, this one was in uh, Austin, Texas. And it, what was interesting about this is that OpenStack as a project is uh, going through a lot of really interesting evolution as uh, cloud computing obviously takes over as a kind of the fastest growing segment of the data center kind of area, right? So software-defined infrastructure is incredibly important and, and uh, something like 70% of OpenStack is actually written in Python. So one of the things that we did was uh, jointly with uh, the project technical leader or PTL of Swift, uh, he and I have been collaborating together on PyPy and we were able to jointly present our performance results and and uh, showing hey here's here's the effect uh, performance wise of using PyPy with Swift. And again, I think I mentioned the, the statistics earlier. It's like more than double of throughput, right? We have uh, data which shows that we can uh, you know 111 percent throughput improvement um, and 87 percent response time improvement. You know that's that's stuff that we've seen. Uh, uh, the PTL John Dickinson works for a company called SwiftStack. And uh, in their product sort of environment, they have a Swift-based uh, product family. And so, yeah, they were able to see, you know, similar results. And so um, jointly we were able to present this, and um, people were very excited about this. The response was extremely positive, partly because of the opportunity to see the 
collaboration go on. Um, there, uh, I, you know, anytime you go in with open source and you can collaborate and talk about how we're working together to make people's lives better, I think it's a, I think it's all good, right? So um, that was. Uh, uh, <laughs> but what was funny is uh, I, I got to tell you a story when I landed in Austin. So I, I get to my hotel that I'm staying at for this conference, and I'm walking over to the conference venue to get my conference badge. The first person I see on the street. I'm, I'm sad to say I didn't, I didn't recognize him, but he recognized me and he said, Oh, it's Mr. Pie Pie. So <laughs> <laughs> somehow, uh, then I found out, okay, why have you recognized me? Anyway, so it's, um, I think the word's kind of getting out that this is something that, uh, you know, we see some real value and we'd like to, to try and help people out through, through, uh, advancing it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You must be, uh, uh being effective if you're getting recognized on the street as Mr. Pie Pie. That's awesome. <laughs> My, my my usual comment is a, a good reputation takes a long time to build, but a bad reputation is instantaneous. So, you know, I, I think we'll, uh, I, you know, I, hopefully we can keep it to be a good reputation as opposed to a bad one. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, that sounds sounds really interesting. That's, that's great you're able to share your results with everyone. Another thing that you said that was pretty interesting, sort of completely unrelated to this, but you'd been talking about how the the Python community is a really welcoming community. And I can tell you from doing training and and speaking at conferences that are not just Python conferences, but have many languages and and technologies that when I do Python talks, the the group of people in the room are more representative of the group of people out in society, which is, which is really great. Well, I I totally agree with you. I I think it's uh, amazing to see, particularly because I've spent a number of years in, other open source projects, and so I know at a, uh, a sometimes a painful uh, level how challenging it can be for some people um, who are not uh, um, uh, males in particular. And this is one of the cases where I don't want to point to particular projects or something like that, but I've been involved in a number of projects, and and it's hard sometimes to find projects that are not only have great uh, diversity but inclusion as well. And so um, one of the things that's been very impressive to me, uh, the first Python conference I went to actually was uh, EuroPython and uh, Guido, you know, made up, actually it was before Guido came on as a, as a keynote speaker, the very first keynote of the project uh, of the conference was a conference given by uh, the founders of uh, Django Girls. And uh, it's two um, uh, female engineers, uh, and Django Girls was set up by them as a, a nonprofit to basically have women teach other women how to how to code in Python, right? And it was a great keynote. I mean, they they actually did a bunch of it as like a fable, um, you know, kind of talking about essentially talking about how to how challenging it is for you know women to really uh, be considered part of the community, right? Of any sort of community. Then so. Um, Django Girls, what's amazing is they started up with pretty much nothing, and after the first year, they had had a hundred workshops all over the world. Again, women teaching women how to program in Python, right? And this was incredibly impressive to me. Guido, uh, actually, uh, in his keynote, he, you know, he, I think he's, he's part of the reason it's like this. I think he's, uh, he's very uh, committed. He was wearing a, a Pi Ladies t-shirt in the conference. Pi Ladies is another, you know, um, part of the Python community that works really well to help encourage women um, be involved in Python. He, in his keynote, he said uh, most of it was Q&A from the audience, and he said, let's alternate a man and a woman asking questions, right? So he made it super clear that that's a priority for him. And I asked him about it. Is that, you know, something uh, that he, it's important to him? He says, yeah, absolutely. And so he's making a difference. He's putting his own, you know, kind of stamp on that. And I might, on a personal basis, I had... Uh, you know, my daughter uh, is uh, one of my daughters is uh, 24, and she's uh, still trying to find kind of her career direction. And she said, "Dad, if you know, if I want to learn programming, you know, what would you suggest?" And I said, "Well, I I think you should try Python." And I said, "In fact, if you know, you ought to check out this Django Girls thing, see if there's a workshop." Well, it turned it out, and we live in the Portland area. There was a Django Girls workshop in another like six weeks, and I said, "Oh, look, at you you could get involved in that." And she submitted an application, explained, you know, what she'd be using um, her knowledge for and how, what she, you know, what, why she wanted to learn it. They accepted her in the workshop, and, you know, she was a little nervous. She said, gee, I'm not sure I'm smart enough to actually, you know, do well with this, right? And I said, no, no, good, good. you know, and I, I understand sometimes people can feel that way, particularly if they've been made to feel 
um, not smart, which, you know, I try and do everything I can with my daughters to make them feel like they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're both brilliant. They have no worry about that, but sometimes the environment is one that wants to, you know, make people who are, uh, you know, women not necessarily feel very smart. And so I said, you know, I encouraged her. She went through the workshop. She was very successful with it. And uh, I'm hoping, you know, fingers crossed it would be something she'd be able to, you know, uh, make a living doing if she digs it. So, yeah, I, I love the the fact that Django Girls is, is ha, you know, has this available. And, uh, and it's, again, part of, I think, an, a core part of the Python community. I think it's one of the things that makes it a very um, attractive community is how, uh, important it is uh, for the community to ha- for women to help uh, you know other women and for the entire community to, to have better inclusion. Now, is it perfect? No, I think there's some uh, challenges still. I interviewed uh, one of the uh, core of, uh, of a fellow of the Python Foundation. Her name uh, is uh, Terry Oda, uh, and I, I talked with Terry and I said uh, I asked her how how it is from her perspective as a woman. I mean, it's one thing for me as a as a male to say, gee, this seems really good. But how about a perspective of, of a woman? And she's part of the, you know, the Intel, or sorry, the Python uh, Foundation. She's also an Intel employee. And she said, yeah, you know, she said that um, it's a good environment. It has the, uh, it, you know, it could do better in terms of having more core developers who are women. And so there's there's more, you know, work that, that can be done that to, you know, get more of that inclusion and diversity within, you know, sort of the core development community. But uh, it is it is a it is a great project for its uh, diversity and inclusion. Yeah, that's cool. I think the Python community is is more welcoming than most. And I think this is just, you know, more evidence of it. So that's cool. Hopefully we can inspire some more people to go out and check out some of these projects that are out there and freely available. Very cool. I, I agree, yeah. So getting near the end of the show, let me ask you a, a couple of questions that I always ask my guests while I still have you. If you're going to write some Python code, what editor do you open up? Oh, yeah, I'm I'm an old VI guy. So, you know, with my roots back in Linux and back in the old days, or Unix, you know, before there was a Linux. So, yes, when I edit, I use VI. Okay, excellent. Yeah, that's definitely a popular one. And of all the PyPI packages, you can include Intel ones if you want, uh, There, there's a ton of them, and nobody could possibly know about them all. There's, you know, close to 80,000, maybe over. I haven't looked in a while. What ones do you like that maybe you'd recommend people check out that are not necessarily the most popular? I'd ask the question, though, what's my favorite in, in, interpreter? My, my favorite interpreter for a Python these days is definitely PyPy. Yeah, okay. That, that's great. It's a very meta answer, right? Like, <laughs> it's PyPy that runs all the, the packages. I'm not a politician. I don't even get paid to be a politician, but sometimes I know how to, uh, you know, reframe the question. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so do you have a final call to action for listeners, things they should do or check out? Yeah, I would absolutely have people uh, may take, a, take another look at PyPy. You probably have in the past. Um, in particular, we would love to have people check out, if you're using you know, OpenStack or Swift, we would love to get people to you know, check it out and, and with the latest version of PyPy um, and really try to, to give us some feedback and the in the Swift community or in the Python dev community, we, we monitor Python dev. And if you have some observations about PyPy that would uh, be helpful saying, you know, for example, if you have some py- Python code and either, if, if you either find you have some you know, challenges with it, um, we would love to hear that because one of the things we'd love to do is I've got engineers I can you know, try and ask to you know, or basically say, hey, let's go solve these. I've, I've given the call to action uh, to our engineers to say, try and you know, resolve these, uh, any, any sort of compatibility issues or other deployment issues and let's make, uh, you know, try and make this a great experience for people. So if you can help us out in terms of, you know, get your hands on PyPy, try it against your, your Python code and, and give us feedback in terms of what might be uh, missing or could work better. We would love to hear that. And we'd, we'd love to dialogue with you on it. Okay. So absolutely try your code on PyPy and send these guys some feedback. That's, that's great. All right, David, it's been a super interesting conversation. I'm, I'm really excited to see the work that you're doing appear in the Intel chips going forward and in both the runtimes and CPython and PyPy. Thank you, Michael. I, I love uh, talking about this stuff. I'm, I'm incredibly uh, passionate about it, and uh, I'd love to, uh, you know, I'd see our, our love for technology be able to make, uh, be made use for a lot of people. So I'm hopeful that uh, people will get excited about this stuff as a result, too. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for being on the show. Talk to you later. Thank you. 
This has been another episode of Talk Python to Me. Today's guest was David Stewart, and this episode has been sponsored by SnapCI and Metis. Thank you guys for supporting the show. SnapCI is modern, continuous integration and delivery. Build, test, and deploy your code directly from GitHub, all in your browser with debugging, Docker, and parallelism included. Try them for free at snap.ci slash talkpython. Metis is effective and deep training for data scientists. With immersive boot camps, in-person, and online courses, you can learn the core data science skills you need to take your career to the next level. Are you or a colleague trying to learn Python? Have you tried books and videos that just left you bored by covering topics point by point? Well, check out my online Python course called Python Jumpstart by Building 10 Apps at talkpython.fm slash course to experience a more engaging way to learn Python. You can find the links from this episode at talkpython.fm slash episodes slash show slash 57. And be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python. We should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes feed at slash iTunes, Google Play feed at slash play, and direct RSS feed at slash RSS on talkpython.fm. And there's been a few requests for the Augthera format, a more open format than MP3, and I added that link as well in the footer of the website. Our theme music is Developers, Developers, Developers by Corey Smith, who goes by Smix. You can hear the entire song on talkpython.fm slash music. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Thank you so much for listening. Smix, take us out of here. Stating with my voice, there's no norm that I can feel within. Haven't been sleeping, I've been using lots of rest. I'll pass the mic back to who rocked it best.